soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and do not forget all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy you'll like this next part if you're feeling a little old who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Let us pray. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, we worship you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Be honored in this place. Be glorified. We come bring you our first fruits, our thoughts, our prayers, our regrets, our sins, our honesty and humility. We bring it all to you, and we pray that you would heal us, meet us, feed us, convict us, teach us, all for the purpose of growing up in Christ's likeness for your glory. Most of all, Lord, be honored by our gathering. This service is for you. So may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing.
inviting, you, you can be seated while the four ushers come up here and we'll worship the Lord together with our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for these gifts. I thank you for the givers. I pray a blessing on both. Bless each step of faith and worship given here. Meet each need in Christ Jesus. But most of all, these are for your needs, your purposes in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As our ushers uh, return back down, I just want to read you the scripture that is our primary text of the morning. It's actually on your scripture sheets. It's, it's number four at the top of one of your sheets there. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 14. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn evil, turn from evil, and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. May God bless the reading of his word today. You please stand and sing with all your heart. Lord, I lift your name.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Father, bless the reading of your word, the preaching of your word to our hearts and minds now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. By the way, I missed greeting someone out there. I didn't even recognize them at first, but Bailey has a brother, Jackson. God bless you. (laughs) I saw someone standing there next to you, Todd, and then I put two and two together. Haven't got to see Jackson for a while. That's Randy's nephew. Can you imagine what it was like following Jesus Christ in the first century, back in the early days, 2,000 years ago? Can you even imagine what that was like? I'm talking 30, 40 years after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. Um, People were crazy back then. Times were strange. It's not that way anymore. Things are calm, cool, and collected in the world. But back then, it's, it must have seemed to those early Christians that the world was falling apart, and it kind of was. Um, there was always wars and rumors of wars and conflicts and stuff going on, and these early Christians were always nervous about that. It, I can't even imagine living in that society. Did you know that half the people were slaves? Half the population were slaves. That meant that the other half was slave owners. So there wasn't much of a middle class, obviously. You were either a slave owner or a slave. Um, And there didn't seem to be much respect for human life. There was no such thing, I think, as the sanctity of human life. If a parent didn't want to have a baby, especially if if, if a parent didn't want to have a baby girl, they would just stick the baby out on the hill and let it die by exposure or wild animals or whatever, unless some Christians came along and rescued it, which they often did. But can you imagine? We wouldn't even treat a cat that way, and half of you don't like cats. One time I had to go get rid of a rat, and my family fell apart. I mean, I just dropped it off in a field. I didn't kill it, but, you know, and that was hard enough, let alone a kid. <clears throat> um, yeah, the newborn and the unborn, they were, they were treated as less than human during that first century, and they treated the elderly the same and the disabled, and it was just a... It was, a, it was a rough time. Can you imagine what it was like to be a Christian back in the 60s? And I don't mean when I was a kid. I mean the 60s of the first century, 2,000 years ago. The, the, the government was corrupt. Can you imagine having a corrupt government? <laughs> the emperor at the time was named, a guy named Nero. You might have heard of him. He was a bad dude. He, he was having this power struggle with his mother, so he had her murdered. He, you're not supposed to laugh about, no, I just, <laughs> he was, uh, well, he killed his wife because he wanted to marry someone else, so he did that. He killed his, uh, killed his stepbrother. He was not a nice man. He wanted more space to build a big palace for himself, and so he, he just had a bunch of Rome burned down and conveniently blamed it on the Christians so that he could burn a bunch of them up, and he burned several Christians at the stake for the crime of burning Rome down, and apparently that's what he wanted. Um, Anyway, the culture at the time, society at the time was just a mess. It was uh, immoral, unethical. They had these temples all over the place where they were really nothing much, nothing more than drunken orgies and stuff. It was just a, it was a crazy time to live. And the Christians, they were mistreated, discriminated against, At the very least, they were marginalized and ignored and made fun of, but at times they were severely persecuted. They were suffering mistreatment from every direction. They felt like they were, they felt like they were under siege from everyone in that first century. Some of them suffered even to the point of martyrdom, giving up their life. Nero was so bad that the Christians had a nickname for him, 666. You never want to be called that. He was that evil. And right in the middle of his reign, right in the middle, was when the Apostle Peter wrote a letter to those Christians scattered throughout that Roman Empire. And uh, they were suffering persecution and mistreatment all over. Here's some of the things, weird things that he said to them. Get your scripture sheets out. And don't start with number four. 
that's our main text. Start with number one at the bottom of the page. One of your pages should have a number one. <clears throat> if you don't have one, just um, look on your neighbors or steal theirs. <laughs> right in the midst of this first century, Peter writes the Christians, and he says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, as resident aliens, to show proper respect for everyone, to love the family of believers, to fear God, and then to honor the emperor. I was supposed to take this out, but I accidentally put that in. That was my notes. That blows my mind. That's not in the Bible. That was my comment. That one blows my mind because, I mean, I can't even imagine Peter telling the Christians to honor the emperor when his nickname was 666. But he did. And then he wrote this, scripture number two. Turn your scripture over. He said, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Have you ever heard that famous, famous phrase? Today, as I was walking out of the library over there to come preach, I, you know, I, I said, I bet we have tons of copies of that famous, famous book, In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. So I just glanced to the right, and sure enough, this was just laying there as I was walking out the door. <clears throat> and that's a sign that you were supposed to see this, In His Steps. It's a famous book. Been around for 50 years. And uh, it comes from that verse right there. And that's because Peter commanded the early Christians to follow Christ's example to the letter, to actually walk in his steps. That means to put their feet in the exact same places. <clears throat> or maybe a better way to put it is the early Christians were commanded to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. Look at scripture number three on your sheet. Peter describes what he means by in his steps. He describes Jesus this way. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Can you imagine? We hate those kind of words. If there's anything we hate as a Christian, it's that whole, it's that constant commandment in Scripture to not retaliate because Jesus didn't retaliate. And I know those are hard. We don't like those kind of commandments because they don't seem to make any sense to us. They don't seem to be practical. They seem weak and impractical in the real world. And I understand how hard they are. But apparently the apostle Peter is saying to his followers, to the followers of Jesus, that to follow Jesus is to actually follow Jesus. If, you, if you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus, Peter says, then you must follow his example. You have to walk in his steps. That's a way of saying that we have no choice but to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. We have to walk the walk that Jesus walked and the way Jesus walked. Amen? Amen? A friend of mine said that a friend of his used to say, I'll trade you five good talkers for one good walker. Look at some of, some of Peter's other words. He just keeps going like this throughout his letter. Now turn your page over again to number four. <clears throat> You know I wouldn't put them in order because I don't like things to be in order. <clears throat> Number four, 1 Peter 3. That's our main text. We already read it. But he says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Wouldn't that be great if that was the description of Christians in this world, that we were like-minded and that we loved one another and that we were known for our compassion and our humility? Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. That's really hard when we're commanded in Scripture by the Apostle Peter to not insult people, when in our day and age, insulting has become an art form. He describes that blessing. He says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. 
They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. By the way, about one million times, it's probably an exaggeration, but about one million times in the Bible we are told to not fear. Do not fear. Be not afraid. Do not fear. Fear is a real damaging, corrosive thing, and we all do it. We all succumb to it, but we're also supposed to constantly hear the words of the angels and hear the words of Scripture and the words of Christ and the words of the apostle. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. We're not to live in it. We're to always live in hope, love, hope, and faith. Those are the marks of believers. And when he ends with that thing that the Lord is against those who do evil, the convicting thing is, I hope it's not you and me that are the ones doing evil. In other words, we do not want to be those who do evil. And to do evil is to return an insult with insult or evil with evil. The evil that he's speaking against here is when his people, his followers, repay evil with evil. And we're simply not allowed to do that. Our theme, as, the, as you saw in the bulletin, is Jesus first. And don't worry, I'm not going to keep preaching on this theme. Don't get nervous. I'm going to get off this subject after today and preach a lot of other interesting things. Because I know you're tired of me telling you to act like Jesus. It's kind of irritating. You just want to hit someone. And Jesus keeps telling us not to, and it's hard. But Jesus first just means putting him first in everything, in our behavior, our attitudes, our, our trust, our allegiances. He has to be, our allegiance must, must be to him first. Later, when we do the Apostles' Creed, do you know that the Apostles' Creed, Creed that statement of faith served as a sort of pledge of allegiance to the early Christians when they were baptized? They had to pledge their allegiance to Christ. And they say, do you believe in God the Father? And they said, yes, I believe in God the Father. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe. And basically the Apostles' Creed was that early baptismal statement of faith. Yes, I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, and the reason why that's so important is because people are crazy. Times are strange. And uh, things are only going to get crazier this year. They're already crazy. And it reminds me a lot of the first century. And I'm always worrying as a pastor that we will lose our minds and lose our way and lose the Jesus way in the midst of all the chaos of our world. That's my greatest worry is that when the world is falling apart, that the that followers of Christ would fall apart with it. And so... As a pastor, I'm just urging us to not let that happen, to stay close to one another and close to Christ. Because, oh, uh, Rick says turn it down a little bit, Phil. Uh, because our, our concerns are, are legitimate. In many ways, it does feel like our world is falling apart, doesn't it? It does feel like everything's under attack. It feels, many, many people fear that we're on the brink of World War III and that's a scary thought. Um, and I agree. At any time, more than at any time in my life, and I'm creeping up on 70. You ever been that old? Um, more than at any time, the world seems on the brink of erupting. The Middle East feels to many like a powder keg about ready to erupt. And, and then, of course, you got China and Russia and North Korea rattling their swords and chomping at the bit to have bombs and bloodshed. And here at home in America, things are falling apart. It doesn't, it seems as if nothing is really sacred anymore. Just like in the first century, not human life, not freedom of speech, not freedom of religion, not economic freedom, not the elderly, not the hardworking middle class, not the poor. There's no respect for religious liberty or religion in general, faith or worship. There seems to be no respect for truth or ethics or morality. Disillusioned words like bullets bark as human gods aim for their mark. 
make everything from toy guns that spark to flesh-colored Christ that glow in the dark. It's easy to see without looking too far that not much is really sacred. So I do understand our worries. I understand your worries and your concerns. I understand our fears and worries. I, I, and I, I share that same frustration and anger at times over what evil people are doing to this state, this country, this world. It, it frustrates you. It irritates you. But I keep coming back to God's holy scriptures, and I have no choice but to preach the word of God. I, I can't help it. I have to urge us to obey, and it's just as hard for me as it is for you. I need your help as much as you need mine. We are to encourage one another to follow Jesus in the Jesus way, no matter what. To remember, even as we're striving to obey, though, that it's all grace. God is holding us tightly in his grace. So I don't want you to, I don't want you to live by some kind of guilty pressure, but I do want you to know that by the help of the Holy Spirit... We are to urge one another to actually walk in Christ's steps, in Christ's way. We have no choice. Look at number five on your scripture sheet. This is Eugene Peterson's translation of the same verses that we've already read. Number five, it says, summing up, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you, no exceptions. No retaliation. Do you know that Jesus prohibits retaliation? Period. And he's never rescinded that command in the last 2,000 years. Remember when he said, Peter, put up your sword? When he said to the sons of thunder, no. <laughs> and that no still stands. That get thee behind me, Satan, still stands. That is the way of the devil, not the way of Jesus. Put away your sword, he said. Now, oh, I'll, I'll comment on that in just a second here. <laughs> But he said, no retaliation, no sharp-tongued sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job, to bless. You'll be a blessing, and you'll also get a blessing. And the Apostle Peter just keeps hammering this truth throughout his letter in the first century. Look at what he says in, in your sixth scripture. If you're abused because of Christ, count yourself fortunate. Other translations say, don't be surprised when you're mistreated or insulted. Don't act like it's something strange or unusual. Be happy. <laughs> be glad. You're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. That is the word of God to us. That every time you feel mistreated by the world, by society, by the secular world, every time you feel that the Christian church is being persecuted and that we're under siege... The command from God is, be happy, <laughs> be glad. Isn't that weird? I remember that for several years, I used to whine. You never, you're not going to believe this, but I used to whine. And about 20 years ago, I had this common refrain in me. I was just so frustrated because I felt, I felt so censored. I always would go home and whine. I can't tell the truth from the pulpit because they can't handle the truth. Preachers aren't able to preach the truth because you're not ready. You, don't, you can't handle it. You know? And I would just complain because I, 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 I still feel that way, that, that we cannot tell the truth of Scripture because there, it's, like a, it's like a heavy burden of censorship on us. You know, the, the last thing a Christian wants to hear is the Scriptures or the Gospel. Um, you know, we don't want to know what Jesus says. Because his words seem kind of weak and impractical. You know what I mean? Don't you feel that sometimes? So anyway, so I was out in San Diego and I was whining and whining and whining. I was at a conference. I think Brother Jim Sawyer was out there with me. And I went up to this famous spiritual guide named Ben Patterson. Not Eugene Peterson, for you who are lixdexic. <laughs> ben Patterson. That's different than Peterson. But, so I go up to him and... and I wanted to have a word with him, and I was praying about it, like, please just give me five seconds with this man. And I saw him in the lunch line, and I had forgotten to sign up for his conference because I never get organized in time. And, and I went up to him, and I said, I didn't sign up for, for a meeting with you, and I, I messed up because I, I have a concern. And he said, fine, come with me. And he just had a full hour with me, just sat down, and he let me whine for 45 minutes. You can't preach the gospel. And nobody can handle the truth. And Christians, the last thing they want is the truth. And, you get... and he just looked at me and he goes, the sufferings of Christ. I wanted him to, I wanted him to 
pat me on the back and say, I feel so bad for you. He just looks at me and says, the sufferings of Christ. It was almost like he was saying, what did you expect? Suck it up. Stop your whining. Deal with it. Be, just plant seeds. Be patient. Tell it slant. Just gently plant seeds like Jesus did. Tell parables. Tell stories. Plant seeds. That's your calling. And if your calling is anything like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who were told, go out there and preach, and by the way, no one will listen to you. Both of them were told, go preach, and not a single person will listen to you. So just suck it up. The sufferings of Christ. So I went back a year later. I went up to him and same thing. He goes, how's that going? Sufferings of Christ, you know. And that was 20 years ago. And reading Peter's letter, it's all through there. That is the sufferings of Christ. All of us are together in that. So I just want you to know that, you know, you have that same feeling as I do, that no one's listening to you, right? Well, sufferings of Christ. Deal with it. Get used to it. In fact, this passage says, be happy. <laughs> That's hard. That is hard. It just seems so weak to go through life forgiving our enemies, turning the other cheek. Blech. It doesn't seem to accomplish much, does it? Um, I know it's not weak. I know there's nothing more powerful than Christ and his way. The gospel is the power of God. But it does seem weak at, at one. Here's a paraphrase of what an actual person said to an actual pastor recently. And maybe you feel this way sometimes. See if you can relate to these words. This, this lady went up to her pastor in another state and said, it just sounds so political when you quote Jesus about all that love your enemy garbage. All that blessed are the peacemakers and turn the other cheek junk. It just sounds like liberal talking points. And it's not practical. It's impractical and it's weak. All that wimpy stuff about turning the other cheek and going the extra mile. If your enemy tries to steal your coat, give him another coat also. And, and that just doesn't work anymore, Pastor. It's just weak. If we don't start standing up for ourselves, we're done. If we don't start fighting back, Pastor, we'll be destroyed. You can preach all that Jesus-y stuff all you want. But if that's all you do, then our religious liberties will be gone. This country will go down the tubes, destroyed by the evil, godless communists, and it'll be the fault of wimpy preachers like you who just stay silent and preach only love and forgive, love and forgive. Well, I'm sorry, that's just not going to cut it these days, Pastor. That is a message going around these days, by the way. And I understand it makes some sense. I understand where it's coming from, and I understand how tempting it is to fall into that trap. But it is a trap. I would even call it a trap of the devil. One reason why I think it sounds like the devil is because it's word for word what the devil told Jesus in the wilderness. He said, Jesus, take charge. Fight back. Take control of the world. Get the power, Jesus. Grab the power of the world and use it to fix things, to make this world great, to make the world just the way it should be. Jesus, I will give you all the power in the world to make it just the way you want it to be. A lie of the devil, because that's not the highest goal of Christ. It sounds great, because it does feel like we Christians are under siege by the evil secular world. It does feel as if if we don't stand up and fight back, we will no longer exist. It does start to feel like a battle between good and evil, between God and the devil, between Jesus and the Antichrist. And there's a little bit of truth in that message. As long as we remember to use the right weapons, as long as we remember that our weapons are not carnal, that our struggle is not against physical enemies of blood and flesh, the Bible says, but against the rulers, the powers, the authorities, the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in heavenly places, it says. Don't forget, that's your true battle against the devil, the flesh, and the world, but primarily those invisible forces behind that. And our weapons are what? Prayer. 
love, witness, word, forgiveness. When you love like Christ love, when you forgive like Christ forgive, it's like you're pouring a bucket of hot coals on someone's head. It's an offensive weapon. It's not a defensive do nothing, just sit here and do nothing. No, the Bible says it's a powerful weapon to walk in the steps of Christ, in the way of Christ. It's like pouring burning coals over your enemies' heads. So bless them, pray for them, love them. In so doing, you destroy them. In that sense, we are to take a stand against the evil and the devil. We're to put on the full armor of God, but still we must fight the battle in the Jesus way. By the way, we interrupt this sermon for a public service announcement. Because sometimes I forget to make this clear. Whenever I preach like this, I'm not talking about the role of the police. Some people misunderstand me. They go home and they say, was he talking about the military or what nations should do? Or what the police should do? No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the rightful use of force that is put into the hands of the police or in the hands of the military. I'm, not, I'm never talking about that. Sometimes I get criticized because they say, well, that's on our minds. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about you, you and me on a daily basis. I'm always talking about what our attitude and behavior as Christians should be on a daily basis in our regular lives. Amen? Now, I do hope that police and militaries would use force as a last resort, and of course, wisely and justly and fairly, but I'm not talking about that ever, what countries should do, or states. I'm talking about what you should do and what I should do as Christians towards our enemies, our opponents, the people frustrating us, the people irritating us in this. And I'm also not saying, let me jump to the head here, that you can't be a good citizen or that you can't vote or be politically minded or that you can't be patriotic. I'm just saying to keep your primary allegiance and your primary identity and your primary attitude front and center. That's all I'm saying. Just give me an amen. Okay. I'm saying that as Christians, we simply can't ignore the clear message of the New Testament. That's why I hammer it home so often. We just don't have the option of claiming to be a Christian while ignoring the words and the ways of Christ. We must honestly ask ourselves, are we people of the Bible or not? Remember, these words from Christ and these words from Peter were written down during a time of severe persecution. Peter gave all these commands during a time when Christians were not only mistreated, they were sometimes fed to the lions. So if we're Christians... If we claim to be Christian, we must remember that we volunteered to live in a negative world. The minute we committed ourselves to Christ, we signed up to be under siege. The minute we decided to follow Christ, we signed on to a life of being persecuted and bullied and mistreated. So don't be surprised. You could put it this way. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive two promises. One is eternal life, both now and forever. And the second promise is your promise, discrimination, cruelty, abuse, and even possible martyrdom on this earth. Why do you think Jesus kept telling his disciples that the world would hate them? He said, if the, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. If, the, if they persecute you, remember that they persecuted me first. Count on it. They're going to persecute you. The key for a follower of Christ is how we respond to mistreatment, how we respond to our enemies. That is the key Christ-like mark. How do you respond? Do you spew evil, mean, slanderous, hateful, bitterness, or do you respond with blessing? I know, I know it's hard. Our, our key calling this, this next year, this next 10 years, is, is, is do we know how to lose well? Do we know how to suffer well? Do we know how to handle mistreatment? Can you imagine any of the basketball players on the Denver Nuggets whining to their coach that the fans on the other teams are saying mean things to them? <laughs> coach, we went into Golden State, and there was people yelling at me and saying ugly things about my mother. 
calling me names, cussing. Can you imagine the Bronco players complaining that they went to play the Raiders and the other team's fan base is, is just really against them? We were under attack. We were under siege from those Raider fans, coach. They're being, we're being bullied. We're under siege. They hate us. The coach would simply say, didn't you sign up for this? Plus, we're paying you $2 million a year. But <laughs> didn't, we, didn't you sign up to be yelled at and mistreated? What'd you expect? And even though it doesn't sell well, we must still preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. It must, we must preach Jesus first and Jesus last. It, it, it doesn't sell. If you want, if you want to sell, if you want to, if you want to build a big church quickly, then tell people who to hate and how to be mean and who to fight, and it sells. People, we want that so desperately that it sells, but it's not. It's not the way of Jesus. We preach Jesus because Christ is Lord. Christ is the way. He's not only the truth and the life. He's the way, the truth and the life. And if you're going to follow Him, we have to follow Him in good times and bad times, in the way of Jesus. He's the living, breathing word of God. He's our mentor, our teacher, our Lord, our guide, our rabbi, our theologian, our king, our savior, our brother, our friend. We have to preach Jesus. He's our North Star. He's our standard bearer. Let me, let me leave you with one final example from the real world. In 1950, there were 7,000 missionaries in China. That's when the communists took over. And Chairman Mao kicked all 7,000 missionaries out of the country. All of them. Didn't leave a single missionary there. They were illegal. They were kicked out. And they all scattered around. Some came back here. Some went to the Philippines. Some went to Hong Kong or Singapore. And uh, many of them were interviewed over the years. And they were really worried about what was going to happen back in China. They were so discouraged. They were so disillusioned. And they said... We were so convinced that God had called us to serve Christ in China, and then we got kicked out. We were, we were called to go there and build the church, and we got kicked out. I don't know what they're going to do now. I don't know how those Christians are going to survive there, if at all. I don't know who's going to run the orphanages and the schools and the hospitals and all the churches that we started. And When they were kicked out of China in 1950, there was about 2 million Christians. Well, when things opened up 30 years later... Many Christians went back in there, and to everyone's amazement, they discovered that there was now 50 million Christians. During those 30 years when it was completely closed, and there was nobody there to help them, and it was illegal, and it was heavy communist rule, <clears throat> the church grew from 2 million to 50 million. Do you know that in the year 2030, the statistical projection is that China will have the most Christians of any country in the world, including the United States, if it keeps going. I don't know if it'll do any good in their system, <clears throat> I still, but it's still a miraculous, wonderful thing. <clears throat> how, did China, how did the church in China grow from 2 million to 50 million in those 30 years? There's only one answer. The Christians did it by acting like Jesus by being like Jesus, period. That's all they had. Thank God that's all they needed. And it's all we need in this country too. There's one solution and one solution only, and that's for Christians to become Christian and for the church to be the church, period. For Christ followers to actually follow Christ in the way of Christ together. And God will accomplish that. Because remember, it all comes back to his grace and his power. He is working that in us right now. He's working that in you. He who began a good work in you will complete it. He will, by the Holy Spirit, create in us Christ-likeness. Amen. Let's pray. Father, begin with me and then begin with all of us here. Produce Christ-likeness by your Holy Spirit as only you can do. Only you can change our hearts. Only you, through divine therapy, can change our brains and our willpower and our attitudes and our behaviors and mold us into the way of Jesus. Help us to cooperate with that powerful gospel, with that powerful spirit. Work in us. 
transform us into your likeness, that the world might see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer. You might want to respond to the sermon or to the Word of God or to the Holy Spirit. You may want to pray with someone else here in the front. You may want to bring a request or a praise here, but we invite you to do so. So let's stand and let's just spend some time in prayer before we go to the table of the Lord today. Father, for hearing our prayers. We thank you for touching Brother Al Sundgren last week in the way you did, for bringing him back home here. We thank you for your love and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Join me as we confess our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now join me as I pray over the bread and the cup. And then after I do, we'll invite you down to receive the bread and the cup and then once you receive them, return to your seats and hold on to them until all are served and we'll eat and drink together. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this great gift 
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Meet with us here at the table now in this very special way. Be with us. Be the healing power of Jesus, both individually and corporately. And uh, turn us into those kind of prayer warriors through the body and blood as we eat and drink you unto ourselves. May it nourish us, but also transform us into your likeness. We ask all this through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. suffering. Well, let's confess our common faith first. I'm sorry. I, I mentioned it earlier that it served as a pledge of allegiance to the early Christians, and it still serves that way to us as we pledge our allegiance and as we join with other believers who do the same thing around the globe today and throughout all time. Say it with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On the night he was betrayed and handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us eat of the bread. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Let us drink of the cup. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we do receive you unto ourselves. And we lift up to you the prayer that you told us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And may you stay warm and cozy. God bless you. Go in his amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross.